everybody going? Everybody doing good? I see a lot of hate for thumb picks right off the bat. Not liking that. Um, listen, for this lesson, you don't need to use a thumb pick. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm going to be showing you, you could use with a flat pick. Doesn't doesn't matter. and Robbie in the house man how's it going guys hi David hi Mike Robert thank you Phil for helping out tonight appreciate you guys all being here give everybody a couple a uh, couple more minutes to kind of fall in here get started so um thank you guys for joining me this whole lesson is going to be just kind of an introduction to travis picking and just to let you know right off the top there are some uh pdfs that you can download um that you could use for this lesson um and they're in the link below i'm sure phil has told you about those um and those are free um the backing tracks that i'm going to be using you could find here on youtube so same same with um the backing track from a couple weeks ago, the film noir lesson, that backing track is up here too. And I've lengthened it. So now it's like a 10 minute long backing track. So you could check that out. Um, and before I get started, um, the code for the focus on Travis picking course, which uh, I'm going to, some of the stuff I'm talking about today comes from that course. And that course is like a really great kind of exposure to a lot of Travis picking techniques. Uh, but the code to get a 25% discount for that course is good now through Sunday. And that code is Travis 25. And if you just enter that on checkout, you'll get a little discount. Um, and if you do want to go in depth with any of the stuff I'm talking about, you could always hit me up privately or, you know, come into the speakeasy channel, anything like that. Tips are appreciated. If you could do it, no pressure. All right. So. What is Travis picking? Um, well, it gets its name from Merle Travis, but this style of fingerstyle guitar had been going on for a long time. Um, this is something that players like Mississippi John Hurt and Elizabeth Cotton, um, Chet Atkins, Merle Travis, uh, then more contemporary players like Doyle Dykes and um, uh, Tommy Emmanuel um, all use this style of picking. And Really where it comes from, it's kind of an adaptation of stride piano, where you have this bass chord, bass chord, bass chord with the left hand, and then you have melody happening um, with the right hand. So it's kind of guitar players trying to do that. Uh, it was made really popular by Merle Travis. Merle Travis was a very popular songwriter and artist, and um, I think that was kind of how it entered into the zeitgeist, um, into the masses. Um, he learned it. He grew up in in uh, East Kentucky, and he learned it from uh, two guys, from what I understand, a guy named Mose Rager and a guy named Ike Everly, who happens to be the father of the Everly Brothers, uh, which is also why the Everly brother Brothers ended up on RCA, because uh, Ike came to Chet, um, and I guess they were good friends, and said, hey, you should check out my sons. They're pretty good singers. And he ended up signing the Everly Brothers and produced and played guitar on a lot of those early Everly Brothers records. And then the Everly Brothers, I think, wrote the foreword for, I can't remember which Chet record. It might have been Teen Scene or Teensville. 
Chet's Rock and Roll um, records. Uh, they're really good. Or the Rockabilly Chet records. They're fun records, though. Um, so those are the guys that kind of showed this to, to Merle Travis. And, you know, really the person that picked this up and just ran with it was Chet Atkins. And he's the one that really refined it um, and just made it, you know, a really sophisticated style of guitar playing. Um, so along with all those PDFs that I have for you guys to download, there's just a, you know, a short list of a lot of the well-known Travis pickers. So you can go check those guys out on your own. Um, there's not a lot of Mose Rager recordings. I don't think there's any. I think there's a couple little YouTube clips and that's about it. So that's a little bit about the history of it. And now let's just talk about kind of the technique and what that means for us, for us guitar players. Um, the best way to kind of think about how we adapt this to guitar is that the bottom three strings are going to be our bass player and the top three strings are going to be our melody. Um, now we break that rule all the time, but this is like a good general rule, a good place to start from. So with the thumb, or if you're using a... A pick. I'll show you both in a second. The whole thing with Travis picking is you want to make sure that you're uh, doing an alternating bass line. So rather than just kind of sitting here on one note, almost like um, dead thumb. So rather than just hanging out on one note, pump and quarter notes, we're going to alternate. So here I'm alternating between the 6th and 4th string. So and you can alternate between two notes, or you can make it a little bit more complicated and get a 5th in there. So that's going to be 6, 4, 5, 4. I'm going to go way more into depth with this stuff in a second, but just going to kind of talk quickly through some of these things. So bottom three strings, you have this alternating bass line, and then with your three fingers, or two fingers if you're playing with a flat pick, uh, I have these placed on the top three strings, and I kind of have a finger assigned to a string. Sometimes I break that rule, but in general, I usually have index finger on the G string, middle on the second string, and ring finger on the first. So these fingers are going to play melodies on those top notes. So that's going to give you like your basic kind of Travis picking where you have a melody happening that's ringing out and then these bass notes, um, I'm kind of muting with the heel of my hand a little bit here. So I can still hear the pitch, they're not like really dead, but they're not able to ring as much. And that just helps because you're kind of self mixing all the time when you're uh, doing Travis picking. So. What that does is it controls the lower notes from basically masking and eating up all the melody notes because those lower notes are going to sound a little bit louder. They're going to take up more frequencies. Um, <coughs> and they're going to just make it a little bit more muddy if they're ringing out. So, excuse me. Um, so we kind of mute those a little bit. It also helps like the two different articulations just helps kind of give the illusion of two voices which is another reason we do that, to kind of make it feel a lot like a bass and a guitar kind of playing together. So that's a general idea with what Travis picking is. Alternating bass line, melody on the top strings. Um, all right, so now I want to show you a couple things to get you started with this. I'm going to use three basic shapes to start with. I'm going to use an A13 chord here. Um, oh, you know what, real quick, before I do that, I want to just show you how that would look with a flat pick. So flat pick means I only have two fingers, unless you're really good with the pinky, which I am not. Um, which means you now have just the ring and middle finger, or yeah, middle and ring finger to use. So my alternating bass line would be with a flat pick. And my melody notes would be played with that middle and ring. And I would kind of use these as a unit, too, So, like I was doing with the three fingers where you know, I had them on the top three strings, but this time I'm going to be either on three and two, or I could move these as a unit to two and one. So they're always kind of hanging out together, and I just try to do as little movement as possible, try to be efficient with my movement. 
So there's my alternating bass line. And if I was doing the same thing with a flat pick. Okay, so there's so much you could do with a flat pick. It's not necessary to always play with a thumb pick. And when I'm playing a country gig or somebody like Boo Reiner's on here, great guitar player, is playing a uh, country gig, you know, we're not always playing with a flat pick. I'm pretty sure, Boo, you don't always have a flat pick on you for that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we have to go to, to Rockabilly Land where kids eat free. Um, we're just playing it with a flat pick, you know, and we're just doing it for that moment in the song or if we're just incorporating some Travis picking in our rhythm playing there, um, we're just using the flat pick. We're not switching. Where the flat pick comes in handy, and I'll get back to these chords. I, know, I realize I'm taking this little detour in the weeds here, but I'll, I'm going to come back on point. Just give me a minute. Um, where the flat pick comes, or the thumb pick comes in handy, is if you do decide to uh, play Chet arrangements or do that kind of style, um, just because there's so many techniques that you need to have together and you really need every finger you can you can use um, to kind of make that stuff happen. The other thing about my little, uh, uh, you know, advertisement to convince you to use a flat pick is whenever I have to play any kind of finger picking on a session or on any kind of gig, even if it isn't Travis picking, it's really nice to have the thumb pick just because it gives you a nice sharp attack with your bass notes and it just makes everything really clear and I think it just makes things sound more even that's not to say I don't like the sound of you know the flesh of the thumb on strings I love that sound I love listening to like Nick Drake play and you know just dead strings and you know the you know pad of the thumb that's a great sound but it just depends on what you want to do with it I think if you have the time incorporating like five, 10 minutes a day of working with the thumb pick. I mean, I'm so glad I, I pushed through and, and got it together because uh, I do use it all the time for things. All right. I digress. We're back. So, all right. Three shapes we're going to use here. We're going to use an A13 shape. These chord shapes are in the PDFs there. Um, so that's root, fifth, flat seven, third, that would be the 13. You could also call it the 6. But because there's a flat 7 in there, it's sounding as a 13. And a root on top. The next chord shape we're going to use is a 7 chord shape, but maybe not one that you always use. This is out of a D bar chord, but I'm going to add the pinky on top here at the 8th fret. And my reason... Oh, it sounds like I went a little out of tune here. I'll just play fast. You'll never hear that. Um... But the reason I'm picking that shape is because I like the sound of this shape using an A7 with the 7 on top. That's a sound I really like. It's a voicing I really like. It's a voicing that pops up a ton in country blues. Um, so that's why we're using this voicing up here. Um, and really quick, uh, Phil, uh, the thumb picks that I love to use and I always use um, are the Fred Kelly thumb picks. Um, he makes great thumb picks. They're not big and clunky and um, yeah, they sound great. Um, and they, more importantly, they feel really good. Any thumb pick, if you've never played with one, is gonna you know take some consistent time investment to get used to it. but you know, he makes great picks. Okay, so then the next shape you're gonna need to know is a nine chord, dominant nine chord. So we're gonna do an E9. Okay, and that's root three, flat seven, nine, fifth. So those are the three shapes we're gonna use. I'm gonna tune up a little here. Who's the culprit? Oh, that G string. Turned off my air conditioner right before we started and uh, all the guitars are not happy. All right. Okay. So out of those three shapes, let me just show you one of the things that I like to start my students with um, is a basic two bar pattern that you can get a ton of mileage out of. You could use it for rockabilly, you could use it for country, use it for a bunch of different things. And I'll show you that in a second. But um, the first thing I like to do with my students is get them doing a bunch of drills to get coordination and strength 
and to get used to mixing themselves. In other words, having control of how loud every string is with how hard you're plucking. So that's one of the brilliant things about Chet Atkins recordings is they just sound perfect, like perfectly even. And there's like, you know, no compressors on that stuff. It's just, you know, perfectly in tune and played perfectly even. And it's just because his touch, was very light touch, but he also was like mixing himself uh, with his right hand. So, okay. So the drills that I like to start with, and I get a little tedious with this just because I want to make sure that I could do everything comfortably. So you start off with just getting comfortable alternating. Get a nice alternating bass line going. And you get a nice like muted sound and it's consistent. Next step is to start adding in melody notes. So what we're going to do is add melody notes all on downbeats. So every uh, alternating bass line here or every bass note is on a downbeat, we're basically going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And we're going to put melody notes on each one of those. So for the first bass note, I'm going to play the third string with my index finger. And then for the next bass note, I'm going to play that same note. So that third string, you notice I'm letting it ring out a little bit more. That's on every bass note. Get comfortable with that. Then I go to the second string. This time I'm using my middle finger. First string, I'm going to use my ring finger. Okay. Not too hard. Um, now I'm going to alternate strings here. So I'm going to go low string to a high string. So I'm going to go third string to second string. So third string is going to be with the first bass note. And then the second string is going to be with the second bass note. One, two, three, four. Third string, second string. Third string, second string. Then I'm going to move that to second string, first string, and use the middle and ring finger. I do that, get comfortable with that. And then I want to go between the third and first string. So index finger and ring finger. Okay. Then I want to flip it. Now I want to go high to low. So I'm going to go second string to third string, still all on the beat. Then I'm going to go first string to second string. Then first string to third string. Oh. Okay, so just hitting every possibility and just getting comfortable with all of them. So in the course and that focus on Travis picking, there's four of those drills. Um, I think I also do this in the subscription channel too, the Speakeasy, where I lay out all four of these drills. They're really worth going through. I'll show you a little bit of the second drill because it's going to be kind of important for our pattern. Um, we've done everything on a downbeat. The next thing now is to do all the melody notes on the upbeat, so in between the bass notes. So we got low six string there is beat one. And on the upbeat of beat one, I'm going to play that third string. So one and beat two will be a new bass note. The upbeat will be that third string. So one and two and. And then I just finish out the measure like that. One and two and three and four and. A lot of people find this easier than putting them on the downbeat. And I would go through all the variations. So. That's, um, that's something that's really worth doing just because you're going to build a lot of strength um, with this hand. And before anyone asks if I grow out my nails, yes, I do. I grow them out. I didn't for a long time, and I just tried to build up calluses. And then I did a bunch of gigs with my buddy um, John Shannon, who's also great at the chat stuff. And I just liked his tone so much because he was really committed to keeping the nails longer. Um, that I was just like, man, I'm just going to do it. And I'm really happy I did happy I did because it it actually made my double stop sound better and 
um, and it makes this stuff sound so much better. You get a little bit more transience in the attack by having a little bit of nail in there. So, okay. So downbeats, upbeats, um, like I said, those other drills are going to be in the chorus and in the channel. If you don't want to deal with those things, just hit me up. Um, all right. So the next thing is to take a look at this pattern. So it's a two bar pattern, but to be honest, each, uh, measure, the first and second measure are totally, you know, common patterns that you could do, uh, outside of this two bar pattern. So first pattern is going to be a melody note on beat two. So we'll have bass note by itself, one. Beat two will be the high E string. So one, two. And then beat three will be a melody note, or sorry, a bass note. And on the upbeat, I'll play the second string. So, so far I have one, two, three, and. And then beat four is just gonna be the last bass note, nothing on an upbeat. So one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. Combining, uh, combining a, uh, a downbeat, melody note on downbeat, and a melody note on an upbeat. I just changed it to that 13 chord. That's why that note sounded different. Okay, so now let's try to apply that pattern to these three shapes. So if we go down to this, this D7, it's a different shape. So the first thing I have to do is kind of figure out where my alternating bass line is going to be. I'm going to go between the root and fifth here. So that's going to be my bass line. Get comfortable with it first with the thumb. Once you get comfy, then you can put in the melody note. It's going to be the same exact rhythm. And I'm actually going to do the same exact strings though it's gonna sound different because the notes are different. So one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. Back to that A13. Last chord shape is that E9. My bass line is gonna be between the root and third. With how that sounds and how that feels, my melody is going to stay the same, um, the same rhythm. It's going to be on the top two strings, though the notes are going to change because I have a new shape here. So one, two, three, and four. Okay, so that pattern sounds nice. It's you know not the most complicated thing in the world. It's uh, not the most showy thing in the world, but it totally works. And that's something that I would throw into hybrid picking. It's something I would throw into a country rhythm part. Um, and it's something that, you know, I'd build melodies and stuff off of. Let me just show you how this sounds with that track. Um, and I'll just do that pattern for the whole thing. <laughs> Okay, you're Travis picking, you know? You could use that pattern all the way through if you're playing rhythm guitar in a rockabilly situation, and I don't think anyone would blink an eye. It sounds good, it works. So now let me show you that second, uh, second half of it, and then we'll put these things together. So the second half is gonna have a melody note right on the downbeat. So right with the first bass note, I have that high E string. And then I play the next bass note on beat two, and I'm gonna have the second string on the upbeat. So two and. And then for beat three, I have my low bass note. Upbeat, I'm gonna have the uh, first string. So, so far I'll go through that slow again. It's gonna be one, two, and three, and. 
and then I'm going to land on beat four there just by itself. So again, I'll do that real slow. One, I'm sorry, melody note on beat one. One, two, and three, and four. One, two, and three, and four. All right, so David, uh, am I lifting off on beat two, uh, sustaining on beat one in the left hand? You know, what I was doing, I, I wasn't changing the rhythm, really. I mean, technically, I guess I was. I was changing the note length. But um, just because I was playing the same pattern, I was alternating between a legato attack and a more staccato attack uh, just to make it a little bit more interesting. So I was doing first time a staccato attack and then next time a legato attack. And I was alternating between those two articulations uh, just to make it sound a little bit more musical. It was the same rhythm and the same pattern in the hand, though. So hopefully that that's answering your question. Um, cool. All right, let me let me finish this up and with this this pattern, and I'll get back to some of these questions, and then we'll put them together. All right. So this pattern, like I said, it's one, two, and three, and four. Okay, sounds nice. We're doing that off of this shape, this seven. There's my alternating bass line. And then I'm gonna keep the pattern the same. I'm gonna keep the melody notes on the top two strings. And I could do that same thing I was just telling you about, David, where I could change up the articulation and make this a little bit more musical. was flipping it I was uh, making that first one legato you know really lasting for a, a beat and a half uh, and then the next one was just a eighth note all right so let me do that over the track so you could just hear how that totally works over a track and that's something that's useful on its own here we go Okay, another pattern works really nice on its own. Um, yes, uh, Steven, that backing track is here on YouTube. So that's going to be the new norm. I'm going to post these backing tracks up here on YouTube. You guys can check them out whenever you want. Um, the backing tracks will be made available for anyone to download on the channel. Um, but here I just I extended them to be 10 minutes long. And I just put them up there for everybody to use um, whenever you want. So um, as far as the PDFs and stuff go, um, that stuff is, is free. Just, you know, have to enter in your email address. I don't do a ton of emails, so I won't bombard you. And I won't be insulted if you unsubscribe. Um, <laughs> all right, so... Um, yeah, you could convert it to an MP3, you know, here's the thing. I can't stop you from doing any of that stuff. Um, but the reason I put those up there is it helps me out a bunch. It helps me out when, you know, we're getting more views on these YouTube, uh, videos for backing tracks and stuff. Um, it just helps me build this thing and eventually monetize it. And, you know, in this weird time we live in, it's, uh, anything helps. So if you don't mind, you know, use them here on YouTube, um, keep coming back to them here on YouTube. It's a huge help to me. I understand if it's a pain, um, you know, if it, if it is like, check out the channel for a month, come hang out. It's cheap. You know, you could download them from the channel. Um, you know, you can check them out there. But um, that's my ask. Um, anyway, 
All right, so uh, let's see if there's any other quick questions uh, before I combine these things. Robbie, no worries, man. You're just being helpful. I understand. Um, cool. Uh, oh, yeah, Mr. Mr. the version of Mystery Train I did up on YouTube here uh, not too long ago, I do like a Travis Pickin version of, of Mystery Train um, where I do the melody. That's something that's in the channel also where it's melody and the alternating part together. Um, which is really fun to check out. So um, I will, I'll talk about that guitar in a second. Um, that is a, a great guitar. I love that thing. And it's super weird. It was like the weirdest impulse, impulse buy I think ever. But all right. So now if I combine these two patterns together, I get this nice long two measure pattern um, that sounds way better than these patterns sound on their own. So remember our first pattern is that one, two, three, and four. The second pattern started melody on the downbeat. One, two, and three, and four. So I put them together, I have one. Okay, now it's starting to sound like, you know, legit like Scotty Moore kind of pattern, you know? So that pattern is written out for you guys in that PDF I posted. Um, and then what I did is I moved some of the melody notes to different sets of two strings, just to show you some other options, but you could apply it to any one of these shapes. So now a little quick tip here, if you're on a gig and you're playing, you know, that progression, like a one, four, five, and you're Travis picking through it, here's a couple other places you could play that on the neck. So with those same shapes, um, so I'll come down here and I'll use an A7. This is like that bar chord I was doing for D7. It's pinky on top there, but you know that's an open string so I don't have to stretch out like that. So I'm gonna use this A7. For D, I could use the D9, or I could just use a, a D7 shape and alternate between the fourth and third string. I'm gonna use a D9. And then for the E, I'm gonna do a 13th chord. So it's like this chord here that I was doing for the A, just dropping it all the way down until it's an E. I don't use that fingering, but it's the same notes. Okay? And I'll bring up a track, and I'll do that down there, just so you could hear it. Let's see here. So now you have a different position to play it in. And then if you want, you could come up here. This one sounds a little weird to do a nine chord on your one chord like this, but you could also turn this into a seven chord or, you know, a dominant seven would even sound better probably than a nine. But just to keep with the same three shapes, I have an A9 up here at the uh, root on the 12th fret. And then D13. E13, A9. So I warned you this, this A is gonna sound weird as an I. You've been warned. All right, here we go. Okay, and a lot of those little embellishments I'm doing can all be found in that 
focus on Travis picking course. Um, just like a quick overview for those of you who haven't checked that out. Um, there's a section on drills. There's a section on these patterns, um, building progressions and in, in all different areas of the neck. Um, adding walking bass lines, adding Travis picking rolls, these, uh, these things. Um, all those kind of things. Um, adding chord substitutions, using chord inversions, hammer-ons and pull-offs. So it kind of is like a really good place to just kind of kick your butt and kind of get you used to everything. Um, a good place to start from before you get into any of the chess stuff. But uh, so there you go. You have like a nice two measure pattern now. Um, you got some ideas for drills. You could do this in a bunch of different positions on the neck. Um, and with that, I'm just going to open it up and see if I can answer any of your questions. I appreciate you guys. You hang. I appreciate you all hanging out. I know that was kind of a long lesson. I was uh, last week. I was, you know, off on different tangents. So I try to keep it a little bit more focused for you this week. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, Pete, your nails get shredded by the electric and steel strings. Any advice? Yeah, I mean, that's like, um, I know, I kind of go th through that too. If I'm playing a lot, I do have to get a nail file and just kind of keep them flat. I also make sure that this was a trick that, you know, uh, John Shannon hit me to, too, is just to make sure that the nails are a little bit more rounded. So um, on the top, side of the nail the the side closest to you you just have to make sure that that's rounded down to the cuticle otherwise the corner will catch um, I found that early on that was a lot of my issues and once I started clipping that um, and filing them uh, to a good shape and doing that every time I played um, they were a little less rough but you know, there's, there's, I don't do this, but there's other options where you could, you know, you could, you know, put enamel on them and stuff, and that will keep them a little bit more um, sturdy. Um, I think there's like, you know, vitamin E you could probably rub on them too. I haven't gone deep down that nail care rabbit hole, but man, you, you know, people get real serious about it. Um, you know, what they're using for nails and how they're taking care of them. So there's going to be a ton of information online about that stuff, more than I could share because, you know, I do it, but I don't, you know, I don't use press-on nails or anything like that. Manicuring is a big thing, yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so Jeremy uses nails. I don't even think I knew that. Huh. But you don't use a thumb pick, do you, Jeremy? You use a flat pick, right? My apologies if you could hear me chewing gum. Focus on manicuring. I should do a whole course on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Let me scroll up here and see if I've I've missed any any uh, any questions. I appreciate Phil you pushing them all up and it's just blabbing on. Um, let's see here. All right, sorry for. Oh, yeah, you know what? Let me talk about the double neck as, you know, other questions are coming in. Um, oh, awesome. That's great. Hey, what's up, Paula? All right, so, yeah, that's what I thought, Jerry. I thought you did that. I thought you played with a flat pick. Um, you know what? I'm not even going to plug that other guitar in. I'll, I'll, do, I'll make another YouTube live out of that thing because it's not tuned up, but I will talk it through um, really quick. And Dave, I'll get back to your question in a second. Um, so, this, if you can believe this, this is how much of a nut I am. I actually was on the hunt for one of these for quite a while. And there was one that, um, where did it pop up? It was at Retro Fret. And I, I meant to go back and buy, and I kept dragging my feet, and then it sold. And then um, I kept looking for one, and... Um, this one popped up on reverb and I just pulled the trigger because I don't think there's, there's that many of them. I know Nels Klein has one. I know of like two others and, and mine, but I haven't seen that many more. Maybe somebody else knows more about um, these things, but it's a Jerry Jones. And for those of you that don't know, Jerry Jones uh, 
was a builder that took a lot of the old uh, Dan Electro designs and um, basically made them a little bit higher quality, a lot higher quality, let's face it. He made really nice guitars um, out of the Dan Electros that are just, they're a little tougher, they sound better, they play better. Uh, in general, you can still find great Dan Electros. But this one is a, a six string, and it's not a baritone down here, it's actually a bass six. So I have a baritone guitar, I had that covered, um, and I just, I wanted a bass six. I love bass six on old um, country jazz records and, you know, instrumental records. It's just a sound I always love, and I always love doubling bass parts with a bass six or a baritone. Um, I love that sound of, you know, combining a upright bass with, you know, pick bass. It's just a great, great sound. So I found one of these, I bought it. There were some issues with it. There's still an issue with it that I've yet to resolve where uh, some of these pickups are are out of phase with each other, and it's real weird. Um, but that's one thing I have to get fixed. So currently, I could really only use the neck and bridge of the guitar. And then this one sounds great. But um, the neck was bowed really badly, and there are no um, truss rods in here. So I had to have T.R. Crandall... Uh, Tom Crandall over here in Brooklyn, who is a uh, great guitar luthier, and that's a really great guitar shop for those who don't know. Um, he went through and uh, he steamed this neck like a number of times, which was tricky because it's got this really beautiful, like, you know, kind of coral rust, metallic rust kind of finish. So there's always the risk of when you're steaming it that you're going to mess up the finish. Or, but he, he's great and he didn't and he he got the neck straight steamed it straight and it's been straight ever since i keep it you know when i'm not using obviously i keep it all slack so uh there's a uh, no extra tension on it but um it is a super fun guitar i have to say I'm, i use it a lot on the uh, sun records record <laughs> that i just recorded of all these instrumental sun records tunes it's on there a lot and uh yeah, I don't know. I bring it on gigs every once in a while when I, you know, feeling goofy. So that's it. That's the uh, the Jerry Jones. Uh, I'll put that here. Oh. It's not as heavy as you think it would be, but it's still not light. All right. <laughs> Does it come with a chiropractor? Yeah. It's not that bad. You know, my Les Pauls are much worse. My burst in the other room, which is another bizarre story. I got that guitar when I was 14 years old. Um, somehow my uncle got it, uh, from, a. I think it was meant to go to, um, Desert Rose Band guitarist. Why am I blanking on his name? Somebody help me out. John Jorgensen. Um, it was, uh, it was meant to go to John Jorgensen because I think he was tour managing, um, him for a while, uh, or the Desert Rose Band for a while. Some, some weird connection. I was never really quite sure. And, um. And John didn't want this guitar. And I know why he didn't want this guitar, because it was, you know, like 11 and a half pounds. It just weighed a ton. It's just a nightmare. Um, and uh, and I think my uncle got it for free, and and uh, it was like a birthday present, you know, on my 14th birthday, birthday from the family. But it's that, that guitar is just, an, it's... You know, it doesn't even sound great. I just hang on to it for sent sentimental reasons at this point. But it weighs a ton. Um, and it's, you know, a pain in the ass. But uh, I did just get this VOS 56 Les Paul uh, from Wildwood. That's killer. I don't like the pickups, but the guitar itself is killer. And it's like a little over eight pounds, so it, which is awesome. And then the 69 that's behind me is not the lightest guitar either with that Bigsby on it. But... It's not nearly as bad as the other one, and that's that's one I'm actually trying to sell um, because now that I have the 56, I don't really need that one anymore. Um, let me see if there's any other questions here. I see you. What's up, man? How's it going? It would really, like, Paula, if I sat here and tuned it up, it, it, this would be the most boring. <laughs> it would be so boring watching me do that, and it would take a while. Um, but I will do it on another YouTube. I'll, I'll, I'll tune it up and get it all ready for one and I'll play it maybe in a couple weeks or something. Um, 
Let's see here. I'm missing anything else. Okay, this is a question from, from Dave here. How do you go about writing when incorporating Travis picking? Do you come up with melody first and then decide what the bass notes are going to... Uh, yeah, so I know what your question is. So I went through this when I was uh, picking tunes for that Sun Records uh, album. And I'll just say this in general. When you're, you want to come up with a finger style arrangement of something, especially if it's something that's like, you know, with simple harmony, um, like a one, four, five, or not much more than that, you know, nothing, nothing where the harmony is like a, um, is a hook in itself. Um, but when you're dealing with simple harmony, uh, you want to make sure that the melody is super strong on its own. So first I make sure I pick a melody that's a good melody. So and with a lot of the old early rock and roll tunes or rockabilly tunes, some of those songs are just not great melodies. We love them for the recordings and the tune and the lyrics and the combination of that melody with the band and the vocal and the performance. All the other variables make for something that we love. But a lot of times, if you just isolate that melody and play it, some of those melodies just sound like Morse code. Just the most boring melodies when you play them by themselves. Let's see here. Yeah. There we go. You know, if somebody's singing that as a melody, that's an, not much you're going to be able to do with that um, for building a, uh, a instrumental around it. So that's where I start. A really good melody. Um, and then the second thing that I do is I like to figure out once I figure out what the chord changes are and what the melody is, um, I like to decide what key I'm going to do it in. So I'm not going to always do it in the key that's on the record. I want to do it on a key that is going to make sure that that melody really shines, make sure it's that uh, I'm playing in an efficient way and embracing all the little idiosyncrasies of the guitar and bringing those things out and exploiting those things. So, and I learned all this stuff from figuring out Chet recordings too. Uh, where you know something might be an E flat, the popular recording, but if you play that on E, you have all those open strings to use, and all of your voicings get a lot simpler, and all of your bass lines get a lot of simpler because you can use open strings. Um, so that's the second thing that I do. I figure out what key do I want to play this in, and that might be a number of keys. It might be I want to Travis pick for the first A section in this key, and then I might want to modulate to a new key uh, for another section, which is, again, something that Chet does all the time. And that's one of the things that makes those tunes feel um, so eventful, even though that they're so short, is because you have a lot of fun key changes. So that's the other thing that I do. And then a lot of it is, once I have that melody, I'm looking for bass lines that do a couple things. Uh, one establish, <clears throat> sorry, losing my voice, establish the root note. So that's important. So I need to establish the root note, and I also need to find something that's going to work good on the back beats. So, you know, I might not do this if I'm playing E, even if my melody is like, you know, a uh, G sharp. That particular voicing I don't love, even though that's like very easy to play, I might go to say this voicing to bring out the third because I don't want that open fifths sound on the bottom. You know, it's a little little too rock to me. It doesn't it's not sounding like a bass player and a guitar player playing together. So I'll choose my voicings uh, you know, depending on that too, like what what notes of a chord I want to hear in there? Do I want to hear a three really dominant or prominent? Or you know, or do I want a more open sound? But I might play that here rather than... And you could hear the difference. This is kind of lacking to me. Just that root fifth is not as fun as this. Also, if I do this with one quick switch of the pinky, I'm getting the whole triad. I'm getting everything with E. I'm getting a root, third, fifth, third. So that's a position and a voicing I could pick that will give me a more interesting alternating bass line. You know, so. Um, 
Um, so those are things that I think about when I'm, you know, picking chords and picking melodies. I hope that helps, man. Uh, we could talk about arranging forever. Oh my God. And, and Chet's the master of it. And Chet does have, you know, that would be a fun lesson we could do on here at some point too. Chet definitely has some, um, tricks that he leans on, you know, some things that he, templates, I should say. He's got a lot of templates that he uses on a regular basis. Um, okay. Let's scroll down here and see if I missed anything. Uh, let's see, man, thanks again for everybody coming to hang out. This is great. Um, all right, well, I don't really see any other questions here. But I appreciate the good questions this week. Um, I hope you guys dug this. Oh, the album... Um, you know, I'm just I'm so busy right now, Dave, like just trying to get all this stuff together, trying to get good momentum with this YouTube channel. Um, and any help you guys could give is very appreciated. So anytime you want to share something you're digging here on social media, that's that's a big help to me. You know, um, no pressure with any of that stuff. But, it, you know, it does make a difference for me. Um, so I'm just trying to get all this kind of happening, um, get a little better at it. I'm going to start posting more filmed lessons and filmed performances here. Um, but I just wanted to get this kind of up and running and, and get a little like hang going first. Um, but yeah, I think once this kind of finds its own momentum um, and I kind of get into a groove with everything, there's a lot of new things that all of us are figuring out right now. Um, and I'm not just in the music world. Uh, although, you know, our whole industry is not coming back for at least a year or two. Uh, so we're in a pretty weird situation, but, um, you know, uh, once I get this kind of doing its thing and, um, you know, could free up some time, then, uh, then I'll dedicate a couple weeks to mixing. I have two records that are done. I just have to mix them. I shouldn't say they're done. Uh, but, uh, just, yeah, when I could carve out the bandwidth to do it, I will definitely do it. So, hey, Devin, late to the party, man. How you doing? Uh, thanks, Jim. Man, thanks for hanging. Some new some new, new people in here. Gary, how's it going? Uh, appreciate it. Okay. Can I do Travis picking without wrapping right? Yeah, you don't have to wrap around the thumb. Now, you know, it's there's a reason you wrap the thumb around, and it's to free up fingers for embellishment. So can you play your favorite Chet arrangements without using the thumb over the top? This is what, um, who's asking this? Sorry, just Mr. Thomas is asking. Um, yeah, you kind of, you need to have that thumb down there uh, if you're trying to play certain arrangements. But if you're just arranging things on your own, you just arrange around it where you don't need the thumb. You know, or pick keys where you don't need that. Like that's, you know, all that stuff. You kind of need the thumb for some of those things. Um, but it just depends on what you want to do with it. Um, cool. Hey, my dad's watching. That's nice. <laughs> all right. So. Oh, great. Happy to hear that, Thomas. I'm, I'm glad everything sounds great. So guys, I think um, I think with that, I think we're gonna uh, cut it here. Um, you know, like I said, I hope you enjoy this, and the backing track will be up here on YouTube. Um, if you could use it up here, big help to me. If uh, you know you want access to a bunch of different backing tracks, come hang out on the channel. Um, the, in the channel this month, or I should say on the first of August, I'm gonna post a bunch of new videos, and uh, I'm gonna do a. Uh, uh, cannonball rag and show you a couple of variations that I do on it. Um, so that will be a new thing that will go up in August. And I haven't thought too much else about what I'm going to put up this week. So open to suggestions, but I always put up, you know, anywhere from 20 to 40 new videos a month, um, along with backing tracks and all that good stuff. And it's 10 bucks a month. So, um, you know, I'd love to see you in there. And then, uh, if there's anything I talked about that, you know, you want to go down the rabbit hole on, you know, you know where to find me. Just hit me up through my, my website or through Facebook if you ever want to set up a lesson or something like that. 
Um, again, that discount code is Travis25. That will get you 25% off of the focus on Travis picking. And then um, I think that's it. And then we have tips here. Um, everybody thank Phil for doing such a great job like he does every week. Appreciate it, man. And uh, I really appreciate you guys hanging out. This is something I've started to look forward to every week, man. It's been really, really fun, and it's been nice to see it grow. And um, so, yeah, grateful. Um, all right, guys. Uh, I will see you next week, and uh, have a good week. Take care.